Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am your host with the most, Alex, last name withheld. Joining me as always is my co-hosts, Julia. I'm a delight to the senses. <laughs> that you are. <laughs> and Noel. You're not only the host with the most, but let's Alex add some more. That's right. That is right, people. And who do we have joining us with us on this fine episode, this fine sunny day in Los Angeles? Oh, you're doing it that way. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I always do it differently. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, already, I had a quip all ready to go, and you really threw me off game, which I guess is kind of par for the course here. It's true. Hi, I'm Kevin. I've been on the show a few times before, so if you don't know who I am, you obviously don't listen to the show. It's been a little while, though, because it's been a little while since we've had Kurt Russell back in our lives. You know, it's been a little while, because the last time that I was on was on the last movie in the series, actually, I think. No, no, no. Big Trouble in Little China. Was that? Yes, that's right. I've got my episodes out of order, too. Was there another one in there? No, well, between Escape from New York and now, we had The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China. Okay, well then, just completely, I don't even know why you have me on anymore. Just completely <laughs> ignore everything I say. Yeah, because Escape from New York, yeah, that was, uh, that was a little earlier. That was a while ago. Okay. But you know, it was such a stark prediction of the future that I can understand you thinking it was more recent. Much like this film. Oh, God. God, oh man. You guys saw me posting about that the other day when I was watching. Yeah. Uh, I have thoughts. We will get to those thoughts probably in the appropriate time. We should mention that we're recording this during the election season of 2016. Specifically, we're recording this in March when we're still in the primary season. So it's, uh, let's just say the political landscape is not that far off from some of the things we're seeing in this movie. The predictions that John Carpenter had. We thought they were silly in the 90s, but they've really kind of trumped everything that we ever thought they were going to be. Ah. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> see, but of course, two of the hosts don't really need to worry about this because they have a beautiful new prime minister. That's true. Yes, we're very progressive now, and we always have been. Can you guys conquer us? Isn't he lovely? He is the <laughs> romance novel prime minister. He really is. He's a very popular prime minister, the son of a very, very popular, popular prime minister. Minister. <laughs> it's a very handsome family. See, all that I know about him is that he's pretty. That's I don't even know his name. Oh, his Trudeau. Justin, Justin Trudeau. Trudeau. He's the okay. son of Pierre Trudeau. Our uh, middle finger flipping, queen dancing, model dating prime minister of your. So yes, if anyone is listening to this episode hoping that we are going to be completely free of political commentary, especially in the current landscape, ah! that's not possible. Everybody's got an opinion on this one, folks. Everybody does, yeah. So anyways, yeah, we are here to discuss Escape from L.A., which is the big sequel return to form following Escape from New York. This was the big reunion between John Carpenter and his producing partner, Deborah Hill, who had not worked together since Halloween 3. Though surprisingly, this was going to be a reunion that was going to happen much earlier because the very first draft that they wrote of Escape from L.A., they wrote around like 1986, 1987, and it was going to be the big follow-up to Big Trouble in Little China. Then Big Trouble in Little China came out. And as we've covered in the past, that film's very, very poor release sparked a, a period of disdain between Carpenter and the studio system, which led him going into low-budget horror, legal woes, and then a gradual, if somewhat troubled and ultimately unsuccessful, rise back into the studio system. So in the time since they last worked together on Halloween 3, Deborah Hill went off and made a big name for herself as a producer of The Dead Zone, Clue, Head Office, Adventures in Babysitting, Big Top Pee Wee, Heartbreak Hotel, Gross Anatomy, and The Fisher King. But surprisingly, by the mid-90s, her focus had instead shifted out of the studio system, and she was just making a bunch of TV movies, albeit still with some big-name filmmakers, and those included Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, Confessions of a Sorority Girl, and the Rebel Highway series of TV movies, several of which she also wrote. 
Has anybody seen any of those movies? I saw every single movie you said except for Head Office in that first batch. <laughs> I would agree with that as well. I saw Clue. Clue and Adventures of Babysitting are like the only ones of those. I've seen. I surprisingly have not seen Dead Zone or Fisher King. I've yeah. seen them both. That's I remember really liking both of them. I have seen both of those, Noel. Both of those. <laughs> and I have also seen Big Top Pee Wee, but the less said about that, the better. Yeah. Yeah, things got weird. And then also the years following Big Trouble saw Kurt Russell's career continue to rise with Overboard, Tequila Sunrise, Winter People, Tango and Cash, Backdraft, Unlawful Entry, Captain Ron, and then we get to the good stuff, Tombstone, Stargate, and Executive Decision. He was currently at the peak of his success as a box office A-list star, and it was his idea to resurrect the Snake Plissken character and the Escape from L.A. project because he so missed playing that character that he still had the original costume in his closet. <laughs> and since nobody was entirely happy with the script from the 80s, Russell signed on board, co-wrote the rewrite of the film, rewrote most of the third act himself, and this is his one and only writing credit to date. <laughs> so let that be known. Kurt Russell co-wrote this movie. Russell and Deborah Hill also co-produced the film, which impressively for the 90s has no other producers. Usually you'd have a wall of 10. And the production was financed by Reicher Entertainment and Paramount, who also distributed the film. Reicher would mostly just do some kind of oddball films like Perfect Alibi, Three Wishes, The Olsen Sisters, It Takes Two, House Arrest, Dear God, and Zeus and Roxanne. They were mostly known for producing television shows like Robocop, Nash Bridges, and Oz. So is this a film that anyone had seen before? I just want to repeat what I said back in the Escape from New York episode, that this actually was the first one that I saw. I saw it with my family when they rented it when I was a kid, and thus did not remember very much of it, except for certain parts that unfortunately were still there upon watching it a second time. Julia, I know this is a film that has a special history with you. I have seen it before, Noel. Yay! I know. <laughs> <laughs> we found one. Doesn't happen often. And owned it on VHS Here for quite go. some time, actually. <laughs> Up until, I think, we moved from Toronto. I think it was the second culling or whatever the word is. Uh, yeah. I had a lot of VHS. Yeah, you had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of VHS. VHS is never going to die. DVDs, that's not going to happen. Whatever. <laughs> Keep buying VHS tapes. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> On that note, I should add, the DVD sucks. It does it? The DVD is a very early, early DVD. The picture quality is crap. It's not anamorphic, so it doesn't play on a widescreen TV, because they didn't exist at the time this just came out. I watched the film on Netflix instead, because it actually had better quality. Yeah. I am beyond hope that at some point, Shout Factory, who has been putting out all these special editions, they just redid the special edition of Escape from New York. I hope that they will do Escape from LA at some point, and hopefully get another commentary from Carpenter and Russell. The world needs that commentary. <laughs> What's the Blu-ray I have then? Is that just the crappy one? The Blu-ray is it's just bare bones. Okay. It's just a typical Blu-ray. I have not seen that, so I don't know about the quality. I just know the DVD sucks. I got it for my birthday. I haven't watched it. And Alex, have you seen this one before? Yes, I saw it in the theater. $10 to whatever the final box office gross was from me. Well, I guess $40. My family went there based on my recommendation because it was a man shooting guns. I don't think I had seen the original, but I did get them to rent it during that same trip to the cottage. During that trip to the cottage, we were staying near Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. They actually had a cottage up there. Yeah, my family um, yelled stuff at them. <laughs> Classy. Much to my delight. Yeah, it was in the paper <laughs> that people were harassing them at their dock. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that was my, my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> She was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> one of the rabble. <laughs> one of the rabble yelling. <laughs> Celebrities m mildly inconvenienced by the shouting of poor strangers. <laughs> <laughs> Headline news. I had seen, my dad was the one who really wanted to see this film because he really enjoyed the original Escape from New York. And so he showed me Escape from New York and then we went and saw this film. And up until we covered Escape from New York, what, like a year or so ago? My memory of the two has always been blurred in terms of what happens in each one, and we'll probably get into why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I have specific thoughts about that, too. So this is one of the rare films that we all saw when it came out 
or vaguely nearby. Well, VHS release counts, but we haven't really seen since. <laughs> Seriously, no. Have not seen it until the second time just yesterday. And that's where, you know, the 90s are not always one of the favored eras of John Carpenter, but for people like our age, like right around our generation, it's like this and In the Mouth of Madness are like the two big Carpenter movies because they were kind of our introduction because they happened when we were in our teens. Absolutely. It's just interesting that nostalgia that we could all have for this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even know they were John Carpenter films at the time. Exactly. And so we'll see how that affects our thoughts. Mm-hmm. As the 90s come to a close in dystopian America, a new president wins on a platform of religious morality as he predicts sinners will be punished by a massive earthquake breaking California off into the ocean. When the big one hits, he's able to rewrite the Constitution and declare himself president for life, and their surviving island of L.A. becomes a deportation zone for all of society's undesirables. Not just criminals and fornicators, but immigrants, atheists, and any believer in a religion outside of Jesus H. Christ. Uh... Yep. Everybody raise your right hand in a pledge. <laughs> See, it was silly in the 90s, or at least it was to white people, because we were like, yeah, that's never going to happen. Yeah. To everyone's surprise, the president's daughter Utopia has fallen in love with the leader of L.A., Cuervo Jones, a new tyrant in the form of her freedom fighter, who continues to maintain contact with growing military forces in Cuba and Central America. When Utopia hijacks Air Force One and escapes to L.A., she brings with her the Sword of Damocles, the remote control unit for a series of satellites which can emit controlled electromagnetic pulses to shut down all electronics in a specific target, entire countries, or the entire world. To the president's great fortune, celebrity outlaw Snake Plissken has once again just been captured, and Snake is injected with a virus which will kill him in 10 hours if he doesn't infiltrate Cuervo's compound, kill Utopia, recover the remote, and make it back before the invasion of America begins. Snake bristles as he agrees. He makes his way to and through the rubbled L.A., still reeling from aftershocks, where innocent victims gather in prayer groups when not falling victim to raging gangs constantly at war with one another when they aren't all allied behind Cuervo. Along the way, Snake encounters the Surgeon General and his cult of body modifiers, a side-flipping con man named Map to the Stars Eddie, an idealistic gunrunner named Tess Lima, an aging surfer named Pipeline, and Hershey, a trans crime lord whose friendship with Snake turned bittersweet after a past collaboration went sour. Snake catches Cuervo, then loses him, breaks into the compound only to be captured, plays a to-the-death game of basketball, recovers the remote, then has a fake one thrown into the mix, and with all of his allies brutally killed in a final action sequence, Snake finally makes it off the island with a flaming helicopter and Utopia along for the ride. Snake sets her free, but she's recaptured and ordered to the electric chair by her father. The president recovers the remote and is about to take out Cuba, but it's a fake, and Snake is revealed to be a hologram as the real outlaw is already half a mile away with the real remote in hand. With a final glare and a swear, he punches the code and unleashes the worldwide EMP, sending Earth back into a new Dark Age. Escape from L.A. <laughs> so, Alex, do you recommend this movie? Yes, I do. But I have things to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good movie. Absolutely not a good movie. When it first came out, a lot some of this is nostalgia. I thought it was better than the original because <laughs> I was 16. I was naive. We were all young once. And it had rockin' industrial music and Rob Zombie on the soundtrack, and it looked cooler, and things in the 80s looked dated to me. How does that association with Rob Zombie and John Carpenter feel now? I was thinking about that. I'm just like, oh, dark portents. And the effects are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, my They are God. particularly bad. Oh, the shark. It is essentially the same movie, pretty much beat for beat. Except for when things go absolutely insane, to a level of which made me very uncomfortable, even though I love Troll 2. <laughs> but was I ever bored during the entire movie? No. Did it make me love the original even more? Yes. Do I like seeing Kurt Russell and his perfect hair forever flowing in the wind while he shoots guns off a motorcycle? Absolutely. They took away his camo pants. That's true, they did. He gave them away willingly, and everything they do in this movie to update it makes it even more dated. <laughs> it's amazing. But yes, I enjoyed it. It entertained me. It made me chuckle. <laughs> we laughed, we cried. We grew apart as people, but you know, we came back and all was forgiven. It's true. Julia, do you recommend this movie? I do know. I recommend it. I agree. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> You, you guys surprised me. I mean, that surfing scene was near Shakespearean. <laughs> I adored it when it was, came out in 1996, and I adore it now. I think that it's fantastic. Here's the thing. 
You can have a really, really bad movie that makes you angry because it's so joyless. But because this one was so much fun and entertaining and utterly ridiculous, I just can't hate on it. Mm -hmm. It did. It made me happy and it made me happy in a nostalgic way. I enjoyed making fun of it with Alex while I watched it. Mm -hmm. Which we did. (laughs) A lot. Oh, there was a never ending well of material. (laughs) Can I add one thing? Yeah. The surfing scene looked bad in the theater. It was always bad, guys. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It was never good. It was terrible. But yes, I would definitely recommend it. Is it a, oh man, you like John Carpenter movies? Well, then you got to check out this one. No. (laughs) But would I say, oh, Escape from LA, that's pretty good. That was was a good time. Yes. (laughs) It's the Dark Knight Strikes Again to the Dark Knight Returns. I wouldn't say it was that bad. (laughs) That's not fair. I'm sorry, John Carpenter. Well, it's more Dark Knight Rises. (laughs) So, Kevin. Speaking as an American... Pause for a collective groan. <laughs> Again, I remember this movie back in the 90s when I was a kid, watching it, and when my parents rented it. It was a lot more delightful and charming, and the delightful and charming still came through this time, but what with current events being as they are, there was just the constant blow to the gut of like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. There were a couple points where I was like, yeah, that... That actually is happening right now, and Mm -hmm. I shouldn't really be finding this delightful, and I'm not, where otherwise it would be like, oh yeah, of course, that'll be the logical extension of something so crazy that would never actually happen. So that did kind of detract from the revisiting of the glorious schlock that this was. That said, it was still delightful, still charming. Even though, as you mentioned, it did hit pretty much almost every single one of the story beats of Escape from New York. Almost, like, word for word. Yeah. But it was fun. So, yes. For specific reasons, I will recommend this movie. On the one hand, no, I don't. Because it's a pale imitation of the original. It is so beat for beat that I don't quite understand why they felt they needed to do this after all that time. And it's not very well made. It is just not a very well made film for John. Even the effects aside, it's shot in a way that just feels cheap. I've had things to say about Gary Kibbe, the cinematographer, in the past where he surprised me. But by this point, things were just starting to look kind of cheap. And it doesn't have the same composition. It doesn't have the same striking visuals. The whole gristled snake plissken shtick, half the time it works, but half the time it just feels a bit tired and forced. But on the other hand... This film is hilarious. He chases down a car on a surfboard. And even steers himself to catch up to it, even as the car is speeding up. (laughs) He speeds up the wave while surfing with Peter Fund. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is definitely one of those... I I don't recommend this film. This is a film that nobody should have to see. But if you want to see a silly, fun, awful movie... If you want, like, a fun, like, stupid 90s throwback movie marathon, absolutely include it. Because it is entertaining, it is fun to watch, but, oh, man, is it bad. (laughs) My parents' old terrible movie party set they used to do. Yeah, you know, Big Trouble in China was not fitting of that. This is. (laughs) This is a much better fit for that. than Because Big Trouble was brilliantly silly. This one is just kind of, we don't have anything else left, here's some craziness. And I should mention, just on a note transitioning us into talking about the special effects. I actually looked up all the special effects guys. Most of the people who did the effects for this were just coming off of three movies. Stargate, Twister, and Lawnmower Man 2 Job's War. One of them makes sense. (laughs) And almost all of them then went on to do Titanic. Wow. Yeah, most of the water plate people who did all the water effects in this went on to do Titanic. It looked like a Sega Saturn game. (laughs) I know, especially just the way that you have the green screened Kurt Russell kind of digitally rocking back and forth on his surfboard. Yeah. He's not even tipping. They're just literally like have a mouse on him and are just scrolling him from side to side. The motorcycle jumping onto the truck's flatbed. (laughs) Oh, God, that motorcycle (laughs) shot. That looks really bad, yeah. (laughs) The whole sequence of the submarine. Yeah. I love the choreography of that sequence, but they did not have cell rendering down yet. That's what I'm saying. It looked like Tomb Raider. 
exactly. And then the shark appears. I mean, I love that sequence because it reminds me of the old Sega CD games I used to play. It feels like Sewer Shark. <laughs> and it feels like a, such a bite to Back to the Future 2 with the Jaws going through Universal Studios. I'm just like, we're very familiar with a crappy CGI shark <laughs> coming out of the Universal Studios logo. That's pretty sure. I mean, like the one effect that I like was the CG stealth helicopter with the folding and rotor blades. I mean, it's still kind of a cheap effect, but it worked well. That one aged a lot better than any of the other stuff. I know, but man, God, I got to give them credit, though, for trying with that submarine sequence. Uh But man, did they not pull it off. And Julia kept saying, how many times is he going to walk in and out of a matte painting? (laughs) We're getting to the point now where John is on a downswing. And I think his difficulty with being able to pull off and film for digital effects is something that is going to definitely be one of the things that hurts him in this and upcoming films. I know certainly in Ghost of Mars we're going to have problems like that too. And the cameras were changing and the cameras just didn't fit his shooting style anymore. Mm. See also in The Mouth of Madness, which is shot like an 80s movie in the 90s. And I'm looking at it's still Panavision cameras that were used for this, but it's using a more recent film stock. I mean, like you have like that shot of Utopia there on the electric chair where they have her lit and it just it looks cheap. It doesn't look striking like John used to. And I don't know how much of this is John, how much of this is Gary Kibbe, who's still the cinematographer after all these years. I don't know if they just don't care. I don't know why this film looks the way it does. <laughs> it definitely feels like a get your friends together and knock this up in the woods in a weekend kind of movie. Yeah, getting the gang back together. It's surprisingly, there's very few people involved in this who worked on other things. I mean, I should point out, among some of the other people involved, I'm not going to do the whole list here, but returning, we have the stunt coordinator, Jeff Amada, and I don't know if you've noticed that Hershey's gang, the Pam Greer gang, are all guys from Big Trouble in Little China. I noticed a couple faces. It feels like everyone's returning for old home week, but no one is really returning. Hmm. No one else but Kurt Russell is here from the first movie. They had to recast a lot of people. It's a different president. It's a different military commander. I mean, to be fair, those actors were dead. (laughs) It feels like a lot of people stepping in and trying to imitate the old film, even though most of those old people were gone. It's true, which is so strange to do of a cult film as well. Yeah. Maybe that's why they did it, because they're like, oh, well, no one's seen the first one. (laughs) It's a very fun movie, but it is such a sad, you know, waiting this long to have Snake Plissken come back. And this is what you get. Well, it's like the remake of Psycho. It's like putting like a goofy filter on the original. An orange and green, yeah. Yeah, there was just like crazy cats and pizzas all over what was happening before. This is essentially a remake. It is very much a remake. He even loses his gun at the same beat. He meets the same girl. She dies the same way. (laughs) Yeah. Muslim Joan Jett. Yes, that's true. I actually said Joan Jett as well. Well, and I know that's the actress from the Hot Shots movies. Yes, I remember her very well. She was in like a bunch of movies around that. Time. I want to point out that I did read a draft of the script to this that was just written like six months before shooting began. Mm-hmm. And yet there are huge chunks of this movie. It, everything from that script is in this movie, but there are huge chunks in this movie that weren't in that script. So I don't know if they were added during shooting. I don't know if they were added during reshoots. But I mean, here I actually made a list while I was watching it. All of the references to I Thought You Were Taller, those weren't in the script. All of the earthquakes and aftershocks, that was not in the script. The whole bit with Robert Carradine as the skinhead Nazi throwing knives in a corpse of the commando, that was Robert Carradine, by the way. (laughs) That was not in the script. The whole standoff with the throwing the can in the air, that was not in the script. The entire Surgeon General cult was not in the script. And the entire arena sequence with the basketball game was not in the script. All of that stuff was added in just several months before shooting. And I don't know where that came from. Well, I have to wonder how much of Bioshock was influenced by this movie now. Because there's that whole uh, with the doctors and everything. Mm. The whole medical pavilion. Let's just go ahead and take that moment to talk about some of the L.A. commentary in this movie. (laughs) Of the plastic (laughs) surgeon cult run by Bruce Campbell. Was that Bruce Campbell? I see. I I was saying he had kind of a Bruce Campbell-y air to him. It was Bruce Campbell under a mask made by Rick Baker. It Mm. was like, wow, that guy's really trying to play Bruce Campbell. I didn't realize that was actually Bruce Campbell. Yeah. Well, he did a good job of not seeming like an actual Bruce Campbell. (laughs) I still enjoy 
his performance. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite things about this movie. It is, but again, it just kind of comes and goes, and then we never see any of those people again. I know. They went to Rapture. It feels slapped in. Yeah. It's like a shitty Midsummer Night's Dream. People just kind of show up and disappear. I mean, like, if you take out all those bits that I mentioned were added, you basically have the original movie. It is a much leaner, tighter, more focused movie. I would disagree on the basketball scene because that did kind of take the place of the uh, boxing match from the first movie. Which hurts it by making it even more like the first movie. Yeah, but aside from that, yes. And then they introduce a giant muscle man who cuts people's heads off and then we never fight him. We never see him again after that. The movie just feels like it's a whole bunch of pieces that are slapped together without them actually fitting together. I don't understand. (laughs) (laughs) Like I was saying, because I was live blogging as I was watching it last night, it started out trying to be The Matrix, which this was before The Matrix too, so it was like retroactively trying to be The Matrix, shifted into Bioshock, and then just went into like Surf Ninjas. Surf Ninjas is one of my favorite movies though, man. I love Surf Ninjas. Kwan Su, dude. (laughs) Let's focus on Tess Lima, played by Valerie Galeno. In the script, her character plays out exactly as it does. You know, she's introduced, she tells her story, she gets killed suddenly. And again, that's very reminiscent of the woman that he meets in the diner in the first movie. I actually really do like the whole Surgeon General thing in general, but I like that then that gives her just some extra time, some extra time to kind of sink in for us to get used to her. And thus, when she suddenly dies, it has more meaning and more punch. She was another one of those moments of me stopping and not finding this charming anymore when she was talking about suddenly it was a crime to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. Again, talking about current events. Trump. March of 2016. I'm not cutting it. He's Trump. We're talking about Trump. (laughs) Uh, Not just. Yeah. We think that she's just, you know, another gangster in L.A. And we find out, yeah, she's been making her living by gun running. But she's entirely here because she was Muslim. That's the entire reason she was deported from America. Let's just go ahead and rip off the bandaid here. This is right-wing evangelical has taken over America and is literally evicting everyone who is not white and Christian. And I don't know why they're not exporting them to the rest of the world instead of isolating them to an island, but then again, that's also a way to keep them contained. It's a very terrifying prospect that we are starting to see people actually wanting in this world, and that's a very terrifying thing. This movie is set in 2013. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, we were like, wow, this is kind of silly. This would never happen. And now it's like, wow, how did they know? Yeah, my biggest problem with the movie is that one of the things we all loved about They Live is that it's John really sinking his teeth into problems that he had with the current political climate and actually trying to do some... It's a silly action movie, but it also has legitimate commentary and philosophical thought added into it. My thing is, he has all of the insight here in terms of like where things could go politically, but there's not much real commentary or thought put in any of it, and very little of it actually has any weight or meaning, except just that one moment there where Taslima reveals she's a Muslim, but she still has hope, she still wants to fight for the future, and then a random gunshot goes off and she's dead. That child gang, which in any other story would have gotten brought back up again, and they just completely disappear off the face of the earth. Mm Mm-hmm. I wish this had more moments like that. Like the first film, while it didn't entirely come together, still had some weight to it. And it still had some of these dramatic moments to it. Like in both films, you have a moment where Snake has kind of lost everything. The clock is ticking down. So he just finds a chair, pulls it out, sits down, gathers his bearings. And in the original film, that was a very dramatic and powerful moment because it's like, where do you go from here? In this one, it happens right after the first big action scene. And it's like, really? You still have like seven hours. Get going. They're trying to do something here, but it's like they're not thinking any of it through. I don't know. The more I think about this movie, the more I'm actually angry at it because (laughs) John has shown he can do something that is insightful and deep while also being silly and exciting. And this is just silly and exciting. I think what your main problem or what all of our main problem is, is that we keep seeing glimpses of what this movie could be. And we're like, well, why aren't we watching that movie? Absolutely. He had Escape from New York, which wasn't a great film, but it's, it's a pretty good one. And then he built on that and evolved it into They Live, which is a fantastic film. Where can he take it another step? Well, he never did. He just took two steps back. I just watched the film like an hour ago, and I'm still really from it. <laughs> Again, another one of my points, though, is how much of this is influenced by the fact that a lot of this is happening right now and is thus less funny to us. 
how much of this conversation would we be having if we were doing this podcast, say, five years ago? Even the whole thing of surfers who have radiation burns on them because of UV holes in the atmosphere because of global warming and pollution. There's little moments there we never builds on them. And that's all stuff that's still relevant today. Don't go out during the daylight. The UVs are going to be bad. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have entire places where you literally can't step outside because of smog, but you have to because you have to get to work. I wanted commentary. Instead, I just get imagery. But again, that might just be a problem of, I don't think they wanted to make this a film about commentary. They wanted another action movie for Snake Plissken. So I think it's more just a problem of my expectations not meeting theirs. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go on to The President, played by Cliff Robertson. You got a nice, good old boy from Virginia. Like, I don't know if this was supposed to be commentary on, who was it at this time? Was this Bush or Clinton? I don't remember. Well, this was during a point where you had a rise of the televangelist movement, and they were very much starting to drive political commentary. Especially with the commentary on the moral crimes. Because there was a lot of, I remember this was, what, 92, 93? What, What year is this? 96. It feels like 93. Oh, 96. Well, even afterwards, there was, this is definitely after the whole congressional hearing on Mortal Kombat, all of mm-hmm. that stuff where it was like, we got to protect the moral integrity of our children. Yeah, you had Mortal Kombat, you had the whole restrictions on songs and lyric mm-hmm. content. You had the rise of the televangelists. You had the post-Reagan, the religious right couldn't quite figure out where to go, so they started driving up in media. Fox News would have been getting started not too long after this. We are currently living in the world that everything that this is reacting to was building towards. Yeah. I mean, we are at a point where Fox News is just part of the mainstream, which is a scary thing. The whole presidential everything is specifically a media circus, as it is in this movie. Where you could have someone like Trump who runs for the things that he does and says the things he does. And turn the camera around. Watch this execution happening right now. Everything that would have gotten someone kicked out of an election or caused them to to withdraw from election, he wholeheartedly embraces and just keeps running. And it doesn't hurt him. And that's a scary thing. I will fully disclose, I am a liberal. If we had watched this movie and done all this five years ago, I mean, hell, even if we had done this like immediately after watching Escape from New York, we would be having an entirely different conversation right now. Oh, I know. Everything has just changed so much in the last six months. So listeners, I'm sorry that with the times being what it was, we can't give you the episode that could have been and instead are giving you the episode that is. That's why I'm specifically saying we are recording this in March of 2016 because obviously our comments are dating themselves. And I'm kind of glad this film came up when it did because this is going to be a discussion very much of its time. Yeah. And I think that that's important because regardless of where things go, this is a time that we have lived through and we are going to take the memory and experiences of that with us. Even if we watch this a year from now, even if, you know, the right lost and all that stuff, and we were still watching this, we would still have that memory of like, oh man, we, we dodged that bullet. This yeah. is what happened. Yeah. Yeah. This is what was starting to happen. Anyways, I'm sorry for making this so political, but it is, it's a very political subject. Why don't we just try to kind of pull it back to the film? We have not talked about the man himself, Kurt Russell. Seems like he uh, wants to be in a Western. Oh, the music, the music, all the Western, uh, the harmonica and everything. Very much a Western. It's a score that reminded me a lot of They Live and that it's doing that kind of cowboy (laughs) man with no name from nowhere. And Kurt Russell just doing the whole the duster, the two guns, the whole tossing the can in the air, shootout. As silly as that was, I liked that scene a lot. I did. That was a good addition. It was silly, but it was like the exact right tone of silly. And it fit him. This is the first of many times that Julie and Alex will kind of refer back to El Diablo because there are are definitely mm-hmm. parallels. I love that it's a hero cowboy who doesn't have a problem cheating mm-hmm. at all. God, I even love that scene where when he first sees Cuervo Jones at the parade, where he just gets on the last motorcycle at the back of the pack and just starts literally fighting his way up vehicle by vehicle. <laughs> I wish it was shot better, but I love the choreography of that, of Jim just literally going up vehicle to vehicle, Cuervo noticing and starting to go back vehicle by vehicle until they meet. That in itself would have been like, if this was 1980, that would be the great climax of a movie. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even need to go up any bigger than that. That would be a great stage climax. He finally meets the politician at the back of a parade and works his way up to the front. But now Snake, I have no problem with Kurt Russell as Snake. It just, he feels like he's in a much better movie than we actually got. I find his performance, and I don't think it's really so much his performance. It's probably the dialogue that he was given. Which he co-wrote. That he gave himself. (laughs) Yes, it's true, yeah. Whereas Snake was informed by the character The Man With No Name by Clint Eastwood. This feels like he's just kind of doing an impression of the man with no name, and there's less Snake involved to me. One of the interesting things about the script that I read is that they didn't have the whole I thought you were taller gag, 
They instead played up more. In the first film, nobody recognized him because they all thought he was dead. Mm -hmm. In this film, he can't go anywhere without everyone recognizing him. It's true. So in the original script, there was a little bit more. I wouldn't say it goes far enough to be commentary, but a little bit more celebrity L.A. culture where you can't go anywhere without being recognized. That's a good point, yeah. And I would have loved to see them play that up. Just the whole commentary on L.A. would have been great to play up more in terms of like, oh, yeah, you're going down to Van Nuys. You're going down to the famous streets and here's the causeway where we're going to have to surf, you know, and all the big L.A. locations. But it never really seems to be saying anything with them. No. I think it's asking a lot to think that this movie is really saying anything. Julia's upset because we're crapping over her favorite movie. I'm actually not upset at all. It's just (laughs) you guys are taking it super serious. (laughs) And this is a piece of fluff movie Mm -hmm. that no one took seriously at the time. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And it seems like it was like a bunch of people that got together and was like, well, let's just get together and make something silly. And then they're like, <laughs> you know, it'd be really cool if we got like a helicopter and did all this kind of stuff. We're like, we don't have the money for that. But like, oh, they'll fix it in post. <laughs> let's make a computer helicopter. And like a whole bunch of people just decided that post could handle it. And then there's a bunch of guys in post going, oh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We've got $47 and we need lunch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I got a mat of a shark somewhere. <laughs> We'll do our best here, but your expectations are a little high. <laughs> and then you get what you got. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is what's with me and Kevin. Alex, I'd like to ask if this feels true for you or not, but we've seen Carpenter take something silly and actually make something that says something. It's true. You know, like Assault on Precinct 13, the original Escape from New York, They Live, even Big Trouble in Little China had commentary and intelligence to how silly it was. Mm. I just don't think his heart was in that particular game. I think he was just trying to make a fun sequel that happened. And I think where his natural politics come from, of course, if he was going to design a president, he would put what his fears of a very religious right-leaning president would be. And again, I found this very charming and fun and really enjoyed it, but I would be finding it more charming and fun if it wasn't so frighteningly timely at the moment. It's true. And we as Canadians, we are your hat, so we don't really have to deal with it as much, although I'm sure... You deal with the fallout, though, so... It'll definitely drift north. Even then, I would welcome the whole thing that it's frighteningly prescient if there was still genuine thought and commentary to it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he was really writing the scripture. No, no, no. I don't think he did this intentionally at all. That's just the fact of the matter is, is that here it is, here we are, and I'm having trouble getting past the here it is and here we are. Oh, no, it's very frightening, and I really hope it does not come to pass. I hope we are all breathing easier in the next few months. And let me just say that I think part of the thing is he is basically commenting on by rising up and playing to the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing an election that is boosting itself on the lowest common denominator. Oh, absolutely. I do agree with you. And so I think that's just where the relationship is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, other than that, I found it a very silly and charming movie that I loved. See, but even then, I didn't love it. I just found it fun. I found it a fun way to kill an hour and a half. But there's nothing about this that, like, made me giddy or like, oh, that was so fun. Except for the surfing scene. I actually genuinely (laughs) love the surfing scene for all of its flaws. Unironically, so delightful. <laughs> we're not mad, we're just disappointed. It was John. a well constructed <laughs> sequence, if not well executed, and it was sincere in the emotion that it was trying to achieve. No, for sure. Yeah, but what emotion was it trying to achieve? That's the debate there. Funniness. It was meant to be a funny, <laughs> absurd sequence. Yeah, whenever it stepped away from, like, the template, the script that they just seemed to add with crayons, different kind of flourishes with, it seems like they had the original script for Escape from New York, and they're just like, Surfing, hang gliders, uh, <laughs> map to the stars. And even the bad guy, Cuervo Jones, is just, it's Che Guevara. Yeah, he's the Duke of LA, number one. His design is exactly the same. Everyone's walking around with shirts of his photo. Mm-hmm. Che, I know, is a very popular character, but he was a totalitarian who came in the disguise of a freedom fighter. I saw bedazzling on vests. It was pretty much the same. He just reminded me a lot of Jason Manzoukas. This guy has absolutely nothing on Jason Manzoukas. I don't know. I, I'm not, I, I was just getting Jason Manzoukas vibes from him. If we could get Jason Manzoukas to come back and do that part, I Re- would shoot Escape from L.A. this movie three times <laughs> yeah. and hand it out to friends. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, June. <laughs> 
Well, and then I also don't know what it says about the political commentary where they're setting it up as all of the immigrants who are deported are also basically commie totalitarian freedom fighters who are going to now invade America. I don't know where you're aiming anything at mm -hmm. in this movie. That's true, because it does set mixed messages that these people would team up so that they are not the bad guys, but are the bad guys. If he had actually been like a freedom fighter, mm -hmm. and this was like Snake literally helping out in the invasion of his own country. Yeah. And ultimately at the end, realizing it would be better if we just started over and so he presses the button. I think that would have been a much more engrossing thing. But I, was, I just had a thought, and I think this might be part of the problem. And terms of the commentary and it not really knowing quite where it's aiming and so it aims too far in both directions it should be pointed out that both john carp and deborah hill are very liberal mm -hmm. and this all comes straight from the audio commentaries of escape from new york where they actually have a very open discussion about it and kurt russell is a very conservative libertarian mm -hmm. since he's now co-writing with them I think that also hurts the script in that instead of broadening the focus, the script feels at odds because it doesn't know where to focus. I can see that. Because they don't want to upset each other. That's true. It also feels like they should have done a bit more research as to what the actual climate was. I like that they took a stand against Muslims being persecuted. That's yeah. definitely progressive, especially for that time when I don't even think I knew what Muslim was. But when you also get into politics, especially into action movies without doing your research, you have things like Rambo helping Al-Qaeda. And if we want to talk about getting into something without doing full research on it, let's get to Pam Greer as Hershey. This actually was well-timed because I actually had a discussion with a trans woman online. And of course, this does not speak for all trans women or trans people at all. This is just what I learned from her, and I would take her word over mine being a cis white male. She felt that if they hadn't made that choice about the voice and obviously cast an actual trans woman, that it would almost be progressive for the yeah. time of 1996. Aside from the one joke at the beginning and the voice, it was yeah. actually fairly respectful. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, they started off with the joke at the beginning and they used the voice. The deep voice. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, mercy. But aside from that, like, she was calling him out on his shit. Mm -hmm. Yes. She stood up for herself. She was literally the commander of this entire little empire that everyone respected and looked up to her. And he had no problem with her either like he was just like i don't care what you are and then they moved on and she had no problem diving into the action mm -hmm. and it's pam greer who's wonderful even the gun joke would work if she had a comeback to it yeah yes absolutely but because it's pam greer who is fantastic in the role and because they do what they did with the voice it feels off and again mm -hmm. a lot of that's just you know late 90s ignorance i think oh yeah for sure for sure surprisingly progressive for the 90s it was no uh, David Duchovny on Twin Peaks progressive, but... Which I'm currently watching still has its hurdles, but it's, yes, very progressive for the time. I thought you were talking about non-progressive, which I was going to say Ace Ventura was one of the worst things to revisit in the world. Yeah. Ace Ventura has become unwatchable. Yeah, yeah. that is it's very... Uh... <laughs> I think it is definitely a step in the right direction. I wish it could be better. Yeah, they mm -hmm. were just dunderheaded about it. And I will point out in the script, it specifically states that she speaks with the dubbed over voice of Isaac Hayes. That would be even more inappropriate. I'm glad uh, they didn't yeah. stick with that. And you can actually still see Isaac Hayes on set at one point where he did stop by. You Julia noticed. But instead, they just pitched down Pam Greer's normal voice. Right, which it feels artificial. I think my biggest problem with that is it just it sounds artificial. Yeah, she sounds like an alien on Babylon 5. She could just been Pam Greer and left it at that. Yeah. Yeah, just as Pam Greer, she shouldn't have affected her voice at all, even if she was like trying to lower it personally. Yeah, it is an interesting role. And it would be interesting to see where it would go these days. And then, of course, she died. So, you know, any progressiveness kind of gets negated there. Well, well, but to be fair, so did everybody else. I actually do have a problem with this current wave of saying that certain people should be shielded from being killed in stories because death is a part of the story and she is one of a whole group of people who dies. And it was copying the exact beat because everyone in the back of the cab gets killed as well. I do think that the death was poorly done and that it was just, wait, wait, what? They're on fire? Okay. There was no focus on them dying, whereas the original is still focused on each person. It's true. It gave each person their individual death in a whole chain. This one was just suddenly like, oh, now they're all gone. Yep. 
I mean, in terms of her dying, we knew she was going to die because everyone who teams over Snake Plissken dies. Well, she could have gotten away like Steve Buscemi. I don't know why Steve Buscemi got Which, to live. he died in the script. He was also in the cab that blew up in fire. So I, I don't know why they just added that at the last minute. It's just a very pro Steve Buscemi time in that mid-90s. <laughs> Isn't all time a pro Steve Buscemi time? I am for sure. I know Julia is. <laughs> Steve Buscemi was the only reason why I bought this movie. I had no idea what it was about. Yeah, because Steve Buscemi, this was in the middle of like the peak Steve Buscemi era which he mm-hmm. has not really gone down, but this was when he was really in the midst of everyone loving him as an A-list character actor. Mm-hmm. Steve Buscemi playing, of course, Ernest Borgnine. Yes. I give them points that he's a different character than Cabby was. Cabby just kind of popped in now and then. This guy actually played significant roles in the plot, especially mm-hmm. in terms of how he kept doing his turns back and forth. But he still had all of Cabby's plot beats. He fit the formula, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he had the enthusiasm mixed with the... Uh... And the false tape. Yeah. Though I love, here's the tape, Snake. Good. Now give me the real one, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's been down that road before. I like Map to the Stars Eddie, but I think the film thinks we're in love with him more than I am, because you have all the comedic shenanigans of its hang gliding Map to the Stars Eddie, or yeah. him surviving at the end. He did not need to survive at the end. He's no Mr. Pink in this. You know what was amazing, though, is that I was watching it, and I'm like, oh my god, he looks so young. He's like 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The like, started late. He was oh, a fireman. He looks so dreamy. Oh, Steve Buscemi's always looked like 65. Because <laughs> I'm like remembering back to when I was like super into him as a 16 year old girl. I had such a crush on him. And Dating I'm like, uh, Chloe Savini, which uh, is a little bit more inappropriate. So inappropriate. <laughs> but when I was Chloe Savini's age, I was like, this is fine. <laughs> Trees Lounge we're referring to. <laughs> and now I look back and I'm like, that is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never knew about that. Granted, I wasn't following Steve Buscemi career there for a while. <laughs> I was oh, just following... in the movie. He didn't actually date. No, Chris. no, no. Okay. In the movie, he I believe he's been happily married this whole time. Yes, he's uh, a wonderful man. There's yes. nothing wrong with him. <laughs> but like anything he had ever done, I bought. Yeah. Like this was back in a time where there was dial-up internet. So I don't have time to research. I'm right in front of it in the store. Take my money. Yeah. Take my money. I'm going to watch this terrible movie. <laughs> $34.99 for what was that movie where he was the director? Oh, God. Um, li- Is it li- Living in Oblivion? Living in Oblivion with one of Peter Dinklage's first roles. Yeah, Peter Dinklage is in that. Or like he was in like a lot of really bad indie movies that I bought. A lot of indie Without like watching. Destiny Turns on the Radio Types. Yeah, I bought that. And 20 bucks, I bought that. Things to do in Denver when you're dead types. <laughs> you might have been in that. I don't know. This I don't is the know Steve Buscemi podcast. Welcome I didn't everybody. watch that. <laughs> it's been kind of fascinating in the last few years where, you know, I grew up always just knowing him as he's this great, respected, familiar character actor. But now finding out from women my age that back when they were teenagers in the 90s, Steve Buscemi was this huge, unexpected, like almost heartthrob. Yeah. Oh no, he was not, he was not kind of a heartthrob. He was 100% heartthrob. Yeah. <laughs> this is all news to me. So many teenage oh, yeah. girls of that era were so deeply into Steve Buscemi. I'm talking scrapbook guys, scrapbooks. Come on, it happened. <laughs> Cut out articles. Hang on a second. Laura, when you were 16, did you have a crush on Steve Buscemi? <laughs> I mean, I think I've always had a crush on Steve Buscemi. Oh, well, he's just got this audacious way about him. I, well, I guess that really fits the mold, too. So I'm just finding out about this. I, new, I uh, really apparently, know. Steve Buscemi was this whole big teenage heartthrob back in the 90s. I like Nevishes. All my lady friends who were cinephiles were huge Buscemi boosters. And being, you know, someone who was so isolated from the world, who didn't talk to girls back then, I just didn't know that that was an entire thing that half Same. of the gender of the time was huge into Steve Buscemi. Yeah. That could have been your gateway, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Indie <laughs> rock, Brit pop. You heard it here live, folks. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had known earlier. I wouldn't have corrected my teeth. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. I didn't. <laughs> That's why I'm married to Julia. <laughs> I love your teeth so much. <laughs> <laughs> Good old snaggle tooth Alex. That's right. Cracked and snaggles. I am the a British big way. fan of an interesting set of teeth. There you go. I don't like it when they're all perfect. They look like horse teeth. My uh, grandpa did some of my dental work. He pulled out two of my teeth, and that's why they're messed up. Aw, oh, thanks, Gramps. <laughs> you know what would have been an interesting plot thread? The Surgeon General going after Steve Buscemi, and everyone trying to save him from that fate. Yeah, for sure. I would have liked more Bruce Campbell. I would have liked him have a bigger part. Everyone reluctantly trying to save Steve Buscemi for whatever plot reason. They need yeah. to, because he has something. Because he's got the disc. He's got the disc. <laughs> That would have been a good way to bring that back up. Yeah, no, yeah. Save the Surgeon General for later in the story when Map to the Stars Eddie has the disc. Like, he's wandering the sewers and he gets caught up by that group. Or have them come in during the final battle, like the Fields of Pelennor kind of thing. 
oh, from the West, it's the crazy splicers. And I also thought my main problem with the Surgeon General's cult of, oh yeah, we're going to use someone else's body parts to fix us. That doesn't really work that way. It should just be a cult that wants to make everyone as beautiful as they are. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to have our perfection. It does not make sense at all, nor is the way they cut out eyes. I'm like, you don't cut out the whole skin portion of the eye. Nor would it be flat. That's true, yeah. There would be an eyeball in there. (laughs) What you do if you want decorative crow's feet. I guess that's true. On the inside of your eye. It'd be a non functioning eye though. <laughs> I feel like if you want crow's feet just scalpel them in like. I'm gonna put it on the other side so I have nose crow's feet. <laughs> Anyways let's get to the um, other two military types. Because yeah, that conversation was making me distinctly uncomfortable. <laughs> oh I'm sorry I forgot about your eye horror. Yeah. Remember that Farscape episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we have Stacy Keach as Malloy and Michelle Forbes from Star Trek Next Generation as Brazen. Oh warrior queen Michelle Forbes. Yep. <laughs> Love her and everything that she's in. I saw her and I'm just like, at what point did you play a Vulcan and or a Romulan? She was a Bajoran. Yeah. She was a Bajoran? Oh, wow. She was a Bajoran. That was the introduction of Bajor, wasn't it? It was the introduction of the Cardassian occupation. Well, anyway, speaking of my 90s teen crushes. Michelle Forbes? Oh, yes. (laughs) My main disappointment is, well, first of all, she doesn't get much to do, but that after all of that talk... That Stacy Keach had in the commentary for bad hair in the film body bags that he's still wearing a piece. <laughs> It's true. He looked very strange. I couldn't tell him at first because he's got the voice of Powers Booth. My memory was that Powers Booth was in this movie. Yeah, because I get them mixed up a lot. I honestly thought it was Powers Booth as a present. I knew that Keach was in this, but I didn't know that Cliff Robertson was. Was Powers Booth the guy that was in the hockey movie? Yeah, that was Powers Booth. The dream guy? You had a crush on Powers Booth, too. (laughs) Guys, he's so good looking. (laughs) Well, how can you not have feelings for someone named Powers Booth? Oh my god, what a bonus. My my name is Powers Booth. Give me the role. Okay. That is like a male Bond girl name. <laughs> uh, you and your character actors. I thought he was dreamy. But uh, he did fine. He did fine. Yeah, no, again, they were just kind of typical roles. Yeah. I love the conflict between him and the president. How the president has amassed all this power, and yet this guy keeps shouting him down and showing him up as a coward. He's just trying to, to blow up the world. That's all he wants to do is make sure the president doesn't blow up the world. He's just doing his job. Yes. And it's a really crappy job, but he's going to do it because he's good at it. And he's going to do it well. Even beyond that, he's going to make sure the president does his job. Yeah, because we signed up for this. You had us do this, so we're going to see it through to the end. I liked his cactuses. <laughs> when we talk about A.J. Langer's Utopia, the president's daughter. What else have I seen her in? Uh, guys! Uh, people under the stairs? No, she's from My So-Called Life. Hello, it's Rianne. <laughs> I've never seen My So-Called Life. Oh, no. <laughs> Again, I wasn't in touch with teenage girls in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Literally and figuratively. I haven't exactly. seen it either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 100%. She is now a, is it a countess? You said she was a countess, yeah. She met like a count or a duke. I feel like it's a duke. A royal dude. She met a royal dude in Vegas. Did she meet the Duke of New York? Yeah. No, he's like an actual like British royalty. They've had their title since like Canterbury times. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she lives in a castle and like has his children and they like met in Las Vegas or something like that. He proposed to her while they were on surfboards. <laughs> the whole story's fascinating. Anyways, carry on. And now they look back on Escape <laughs> from LA and laugh and laugh. Well, he didn't know that she was an actress and she didn't know that he had a castle, but somehow they made it work. I don't think a right wing religious leader would name his daughter Utopia. I also that seems have very a socialist. With that. Well, that was a bit of heavy handed thing. That, yeah. that does not seem right at all. <laughs> Utopia is the daughter of the creator of Dystopia. Yeah. Uh, by the way, yes, yeah, she married Lord Charles Courtenay. There you go. And he asked her to marry her while the pair sat on surfboards off the coast of Canada. California. So again, thematically tying. See, I know things. There you go. With Peter Fonda. (laughs) He oversaw the wedding. What a dream. And yes, so she played Rianne, who was the alcoholic best friend of Claire Danes. She was the one who was like the super cool friend that she met up with beforehand, who had like dreads Mm -hmm. and like, was her, Ricky and Claire Danes. And then eventually, you know, she had to face her drinking problem and maybe her mom wasn't the best. But we all grew together. (laughs) Those 13 episodes really... uh, Do deep impact. Got a lot of young ladies through high school. (laughs) And she does still act. She was on private practice. Oh, that's impressive. That's awesome. I wouldn't. (laughs) She 
took a few years off, but she's been coming back. There you go. Reverse Grace Kelly. Yep, she had some babies. The two things that I know her from, she was in The People Under the Stairs, the Wes Craven movie, where she was the creepy little girl in the house. Or she was like a teenage girl, but she was dressed up like a little girl. Huh. And then the movie Arcade by Full Moon, which is just a really fun, stupid little movie. So Alex and Julia, because we did bring some things up in El Diablo, how do you feel the Cuervo Jones utopia dynamic fares here compared to the Hattie El Diablo dynamic from El Diablo? It's like night and day. She knew what she was getting into. She mm-hmm. went in on her own free accord. She had agency. And then she also, when things got really crazy, knew when to get out and did a wonderful turn to the light side. So thumbs up for me. I don't really think they have anything to do with each other. This woman, in the first movie, she was kidnapped and taken against her will. She ran out to El Diablo and left with him. Yeah, but not to go with him. She just wanted to see what was going on because she liked excitement. It wasn't like, oh, hey, what's up, evil guy? I totally want to go with you and hang out with you. This girl had an online relationship with this guy for months, was totally in love with him, stole something, stole the plane, the presidential plane was F Force One or whatever. Stole the um, talked to the media, went there, was sitting next to him in the car in a bedazzled jacket with his face on. <laughs> she was 100% involved, ready to go. And that's what I mean is that by adding all of those elements to it, what could have otherwise been a similar dynamic, that instantly <laughs> improves it. Well, yeah, because the other one was just captured and, well, I don't want to get into it, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> used quite badly. And I do think a lot of comparisons can be made in terms of El Diablo and at least what we heard was his rising of an empire and Cuervo Jones and him rising his empire. I think Mm -hmm. that is also much more successful in this film than it was in that one. Well, yeah, his whole operation makes a lot more sense about how he would be able to turn a bunch of disenfranchised, frightened people into a gang. Anyways, Kevin, El Diablo, interesting movie. Sounds like it. Lou Gossett Jr. (laughs) I will say the thing that irritated me and bothered me the absolute most the first time around still (laughs) bothered me this time around. It's a very important point, too. I think we should definitely talk about this at length. Is when Steve Buscemi puts the nail polish on the mini CD, which, by the way, we have in the future. Mini CD. <laughs> Remember when we thought everything was going to be like little teeny tiny CDs? It's just going to be smaller. <laughs> it's the same I thing thought that was what it was going to be, yeah. <laughs> USB ports hadn't yeah. quite become a thing yet. No. <laughs> so he puts the drop of nail polish on the mini CD and then closes the player immediately. I'm like, there's no time for that to dry. That's going to be smushed all over the place. <laughs> it bothered me in 96. Plus it beads up like this really big bead of... That would take at least 15 minutes, minimum, even at extreme dry. (laughs) Well, you know, to dry it out, he could have just held it out while he was on the hang lighter. That would have dried. I don't care how he does it, but he shouldn't be closing that machine right away. Oh, yeah, I know. Absolutely. 2016 still irks me. There you go. You know what? Future nail polish is insta dry. <laughs> Even insta dry. I'm sorry. Nope. <laughs> In the future, they have instant drying nail polish and they have silent generators because I don't know how they were getting electricity. Yeah, there was a lot of electricity <laughs> going on in there that didn't make any sense. And you were saying they were shooting off guns way too much for yeah, like where no, are these bullets coming uh, no from? industry. <laughs> like, are they? I assume smuggling. smuggling. Well, again, they had direct ties to Central America. Yeah. I mean, you'd still have to smuggle them in, which would be incredibly dangerous to do. I can't see why you'd be shooting off guns for the fun of it. Well, that and all the gasoline, I basically just looked at it as Mad Max rules. Mad Max like, logic. We, all you have to say is that there is a way to do it, and then you just move on. We've generated 15 tons of gasoline. <laughs> well, and again, you know, they did get into that a little bit, because Taslima again talked into, you know, I was part of the gun running operation. These are the tunnels we used. They didn't get into it much. Well, everything falls apart under scrutiny in this movie. I notch it up to, he has those ties to Cuba and Central America, and they are preparing to invade America. So they Mm -hmm. are part of arming everyone up. Though, yeah, I don't know how they are hoping to then invade from an island that's surrounded by walls and armed guards. (laughs) But again, that's why they wanted the Sword of Damocles. Anyways, you know, one thing that you did bring up a couple of times, Kevin, the, the music. Mm-hmm. I kind of love the score because I love how it takes the original, but even just setting aside the soundtrack, you get these kind of interesting synth remixes. You get a very Western vibe. Yeah, I kind of liked it too. Uh, Shirley Walker's got a very interesting career where she works with another pre-existing score. Like, was that her with Batman, the animated series? Yeah, I was going to mention that. This is Shirley Walker 
the Batman the Animated Series. So she took the Tim Burton template for the score and then added lots of flourishes to it because I love her score for uh, Mask of the Phantasm. I think it was a great job. I think the um, soundtrack, aside from the score, was one of the major dating factors. I kept talking to Julia. I could not believe that this was from 1996. And I'm like, everything they're playing is from like 92 to 94. Everything felt like the movie was shelved for a couple years. And I'm like, that was back to back, Stabbing Westward, Tori Amos and Tool, and not even from their albums close to 96. They were all from like 92 to 94. It was very um, interesting. <laughs> uh, and this wasn't shell. They finished filming just eight months before it came out. There you go. So it's strange. I guess he just liked that period of industrial rock. Well, it felt like an early 90s movie instead of a late 90s movie because 1996, that was also Star Trek First Contact. Exactly. It was Star Trek First Contact and The Prodigy. Like things were moving in a definitely different direction. But it felt like a 92. Well, when I was trying to pin it down, I was like 92, 93. Yeah, I would have said the same. I need to add, though, that part of that was also John Carpenter was friends and mentors to a lot of that generation of musicians. And in fact, would bring in a lot of them to do the score with him on Ghosts of Mars, which Buckethead did the score with him on that. Okay. So, I mean, he was very much a fan of that group of musicians, and they very much considered themselves to be influenced by his music growing up. I know that's why there's a lot of ties. That's why Rob Zombie was friends with him for a while. Yeah, I could see that. It doesn't really, like, his synth scores don't really reflect in the music of that time as they do more these days, but I can understand what you're saying. No, from the industrial music that I've listened to has basically, like, John Carpenter-style synth scores in the back and then that other music coming in over it. And they definitely use a lot of samples from John Carpenter films, for sure. But yeah, Shirley Walker, we mentioned her because she did the score for Memoirs of Invisible Man. And for those who don't remember, she also did the score for Final Destination. She didn't do that many movies, but she did Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond. Sadly, she passed away in 2006, but her successor, Lolita Ritmanis, who also worked on this film as an orchestrator, is then the person who then went on to do Justice League and Ben 10 and all the other DC projects to this day. She's currently doing the score to the Killing Joke animated version. Oh, well. So it's like all the DC animated films kind of have a root here. Hmm. And again, she did Memoirs of Invisible Man right in the same year she did Batman the Animated Series. Oh, wow. I do not remember the score to <laughs> Memoirs of an Invisible Man. And I know her and John got together really well and they hoped to work together on more scores, but she was just too busy with other stuff. It makes sense. And then again, she sadly passed away in 2006 of cancer. Very sad. Left a wonderful legacy, though. Mm hmm. And then just quickly running through the other people in this who returned from past Carpenter films, we had Peter Jason, the actor, the guy who kind of looks like Meatloaf. He just had a very brief role there as the kind of prison warden. Mm -hmm. We had editor Edward A. Warshelka, assistant director Christian Delapena, production designer Lawrence G. Paul, art director Bruce Crone, makeup effects supervisor Rick Baker, costume designer Robin Michael Blush, the sound team of Tommy Kazi, Steve Maslow, Donald Flick, Ron Burlett, Michael Casper, John Dunn, John Pospiel, and David Williams. Williams, cameraman Judd Kell and Chris Squires, key grips Charles Saldana, way too many stunt performers to name. Seriously, this film had almost a hundred stunt credits. It would make sense. There were so many stunt people. <laughs> there was a lot of people running around. And location managers Ken Levette and Gregory Alpert, script supervisor Bano Bandari, and sadly not a single boom operator is credited on this movie. <laughs> What's interesting is we talked about how he had lost that entire crew of people that he had worked with in the 80s. A large part of the crew that he did this one with, half of them came from In the Mouth of Madness and Village of the Damned, and half of them came from Memoirs of Invisible Man and Body Bag. So it's kind of like this is kind of the B team, the new generation that's mm. kind of slipped in to make movies with him. I seriously think, though, that still part of a lot of the fall down of John is losing those collaborators and mm. never really being able to find anyone significant to fill those roles. It's all from my perspective. I can't really say for sure, but it does feel like that. Yeah. The film was released on August 9th, 1996, with a budget of 50 million. So how do you think this film did? 60 million. 20 million. <laughs> Two bucks. I'd say <laughs> low. 80. So this film opened at number three. Behind Jack, which was number one. Wow. And A Time to Kill, which was already in its third week of release. <laughs> By the second week, Tin Cup and the Fan came out and Escaped dropped to number six, right behind Independence Day, which was in its seventh week. Wow. By the third week, Escape dropped to number 10, right behind the debut of Solo, the Mario Van Peebles movie. Oh, yep, yeah, I got it. I remember that one now. I remember the ads in comics, yeah. Yeah, I never saw it. In week four, Escape was at number 16, 
right behind the number 15 debut of The Stupids. Oh my god, I remember The Stupids. <laughs> it opened at number 15. That sounds about right. I never saw that. <laughs> and by its fifth week, Escape from L.A. no longer appears on the box office rankings. Sorry. Ultimately, against its $50 million budget, it pulled in $25.5 million. Uh-oh. <laughs> so it bombed. Yeah, it sounds like a big bomb. We're definitely at the downfall of Carpenter. We're at the precipice. We have gone so far downhill, we're nearing the edge of the cliff. <laughs> we love you, John. We love you, but gotta be honest about what happened. <laughs> and I should point out, though, that despite all this failing, in the early 2000s, Carpenter and Russell had bought back a chunk of the rights to Snake Plissken and tried to relaunch it as a multimedia franchise, which failed to catch on. And there are links that I'll share in the show notes, and I think I shared them with you too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Where, first of all, Namco was putting together a prequel video game called Snake Plissken's First Escape. Did you, either of you watch the demo reel for that? I did indeed. I watched it at work. I didn't have a chance. I was busy at work. Okay. But I looked through a lot of the concept art. They had completed levels. They had completed most of the animation. The game was all set to go, and I don't know what happened, but it was never released. And it may have fallen victim to, by 2005, Namco merged with Bandai. Mm. So I don't know if that changed the rights handling. I don't know what happened. But anyways, and then around 2003, 2004, Production IG, which was then known for doing all the Ghost in the Shell things. They did the movie. They did the TV show. These days, they do Attack on Titan, marvelous anime studio. They were going to do an anime series called Snake. Despite the fact that there are design sheets that never went forward, I don't know what happened to it. I don't know why it never happened. And the most we ever got from this brief attempted resurgence, and it was trying to launch. I remember going to San Diego Comic Con in 2001 or 2002, and they had a panel where it was just two guys with nothing to show because John Carpenter didn't come. <laughs> and they were just talking about all this wonderful stuff that they were going to make that none of it ever came about. The only thing we got were four issues of a Snake Plissken comic book series. Which unfortunately came out from CrossGen right at the time the CrossGen folded and went into bankruptcy. <laughs> so that resurgence never happened. Years and years later, 2014, Boom Comics finally launched an Escape from New York ongoing comic series. But we'll be getting into that and the rest of the comic run. Me and JD over at the uh, spinoff show that we're doing now covering all the comic books, Long Box Carpentry. And then there have also been numerous attempts over the years to remake Escape from New York. I know Gerard Butler was going to star in it for a while. Boo. Yeah, and that just kept trading hands from studio to studio over the years. I know Carpenter still has a stake in it, so he gets to be involved whether he wants to be or not. And it's just never gotten off the ground. I have a script for it, but then that's a script from like a few years ago, and it's since changed studios. And they just announced it again recently that they're starting again. If that remake ever happens, I will at some point sit down and actually compile the history of the escape from new york remake that'll be fun mm. otherwise i have nothing left to add about snake plissken except he will kind of be back because the movie ghosts of mars originally started as escape from mars amazing and began life as a snake plissken sequel before it was rewritten so we we will have you back for that one kevin that'll be fun yeah <laughs> Now, any final thoughts from anyone else on Escape from L.A.? Nope, not so whatsoever. I have to go uh, pick up my daughter now. Ah, uh, ditto. <laughs> American Spirit Cigarettes, just to drive that final point home. <laughs> well, we can make America great again. Uh, 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 uh. Sobbing, sobbing, <laughs> sobbing. Uh. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. You guys ready to kink shame John Carpenter? That is, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going to be able to go as far with that as you want to. <laughs> I got exactly as far with that as I wanted to. Anything else is extra. <laughs>
Is it about exactly what I think it's about? It's about devil-possessed arcade machines that pull people into a CG environment of horrible green screen effects. It's even better than I thought it was. <laughs> Wasn't that a Campfire Tales episode? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, but it was written by David S. Goyer. Amazing. And stars John Delancey as the owner of the arcade. Are you sure that that wasn't a Campfire Tales episode? And the other kids are Seth Green and Peter Billingsley. Amazing. I highly recommend it. Because I know I've seen this Campfire Tales episode. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you mean, are you afraid of the dark? Whatever it was with the, with the, bo- with the box that they opened at the campfire. Yeah, whatever the, whatever that show was. It's not the one that's viewer beware, you're in for a scare. No, not that <laughs> one. The one where they where the opening credit sequence was them opening of the box. Yeah, we're at the Midnight Society. Yes, that one. Okay, whatever that was, there was an episode where there was the haunted pinball machines and everything. And I can't believe they made a full feature film out of that episode. 